lots, but I was really hoping that Catherine would really dive into the women's movements because I'm going to be talking about sort of the other side of that in political settlements, but particularly focusing on armed conflict and peace processes. So I think the way that the mornings progressed has worked really nicely and that Fanula has given us a broad sort of way of understanding gender in a political settlements paradigm that's quite critical, but also quite deeply informed by a feminist epistemological framework. Um, I'm a political scientist, and so I get really excited about what we're actually specifically talking about. I think that my sort of theoretical contribution boils down much more to what are the operationalizable units of analysis and levels of analysis. And so I'm going to try and talk about kind of how we might disaggregate some of these things in practice and what's, you know, what's scalable for comparison and what's not. Um, in terms of the outline, I'm first going to talk about political settlements and violent conflict and then talk about sort of institutions, conceptualizing institutions, which I noticed yesterday was in the title, so I brought it back into what was otherwise going to be a very different presentation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about gender in, in two specific ways. One is women in armed groups and their role in peace processes. And the other is, well, and also just women in armed groups in conflict in particular. And then kind of the flip side is the outcomes of, of peace settlements. When we have pieces of paper, what, what does it say about gender? Um, and I think that, you know, these obviously are part of a, a processual analysis and approach to political settlements. So in terms of conflict, I focus in particular on the internal dynamics of armed conflict, and I have a new research project that's part of the broader program that looks at post-conflict trajectories. Um, but I think that my encounter with political settlements research is that it has a kind of fuzzy relationship with armed conflict. So I'd like to suggest that war is actually the violent contestation of political settlements. So if you think about war as politics by other means, I mean, it, it makes sense that what that means for political settlements is that armed actors are using violence as a way to try to reshape and claim aspects of the political settlement. So it's about the disruption of the settlement that exists. Um, you can think about it in terms of rupture and rejection, that war gives rise to new institutions. They're often opportunistic. They're focused on the survival and durability of the armed groups that are fighting, whether these are rebels, state militaries, everyone is interested in survival and war. It really puts survival front and center in what politics is. It's much less about the long game and much more about the short game and posturing. Um, and I've just I've skipped over, I'm gonna focus primarily on rebellion and insurgency because that's sort of my area of expertise. So I've given a definition there, but the reason I'm also focusing on rebellion and insurgency is because that's where there's really a sharp-edged sword that's trying to break apart a political settlement. And I think it's interesting to think about how that might give rise to, to new opportunities for transforming space or new institutions and who gets power and how, um, which I'll get to fairly quickly in this case. Um, so if that's what war is, then peace processes are the sort of nonviolent spaces and temporal openings for brokering new settlements. So for, for our purposes in this summer school, it's really important to think about the relationship between the peace process and the war, and what are they both doing to the notion of a political settlement or unsettlement, as Christine said yesterday. Um, they're a way of bridging this sort of creative destruction of war, where rebel groups are creating new organizations and new political demands. And it bridges that with the post facto settlement. Right, the, the objective in peace processes is to get to a settled space, to stabilize and then to reconstruct a balance of power and distribution of resources in society that's no longer violently contested. Um, I think it's obvious, but we sometimes forget that peace settlements are only successful insofar as the military and political actors continue to buy into them. So in that way, they're constantly being reconstituted. And I think it's, it's important to remember that there's that sort of, even in, in the context of of stasis and stability, that inaction, the way Catherine was talking about it, that inaction is actually an action in itself. It's a respect of the settlement. So their buy-in is a continual process. So even if we think about settlement through the sort of like snapshot of a panel study, this hasn't changed, this hasn't changed, this hasn't changed, this hasn't changed, that would be a very stable settlement, but actually people are continually buying into it. Okay, now, Pausing on that, um, I want to talk quickly about the kind of conceptual framework of institutions and organizations. Um, institutions, and I'll refer back to it at the end, so we're just putting it out here for now. Institutions are, in political science, they're conceived of as rules, norms, and constraints. 
they can be formal or informal, which we talked about yesterday. Um, and an easy way to think about them or a sort of convenient definition is rules in form versus rules in use. So that you may or may not have kind of a symmetry or an agreement between the rules in practice, the things that, that actors agree to do because they've been taught to do them, and the things that they are told to do, whether or not they do them. Um, one of the troubling things for me with institutions is that there's a sort of tautology built into the definition. So things are considered to be institutions when they have some sort of persistence or durability. You talk about things being institutionalized. If something is fleeting, or if it's contested, or if it's disputed, then it's usually not conceived of as an institution. So there's, there's a sort of gap in, in terms of the concept for our purposes, particularly focusing on armed conflict and moving from conflict into peace. Organizations, on the other hand, are entities with preferences. They're actors. They have interests. They're constituted by individuals. They're usually defined in terms of structures and relational ties. Um, and the reason I wanted to present these side by side is because I'm particularly prone to slippage between them, and I may slip between them today, hopefully not. But um, I think it's also it's useful for thinking about how they work together, and particularly how they work together both in war and the kind of creation of new institutions and the contestation of institutions by organizations, but also how they work in peace. And so I thought of this quite spatially in terms of kind of circles and triangles and squares, but I decided not to put a slide in case that wasn't how people's brains work. But if you think about sort of before war, there a, there's a certain set of institutions in society. And during war, new organizations come up. They have to be created to fight the conflict. And they introduce new institutions that are not all agreed upon by the actors in the pre-war society. And after war, if we, if we conceive of war as a moment rather than as the process, which I'll talk about in a second. After war, you've got a different set of institutions, some from before the war, some from during the war, and some are new peacetime institutions and peacetime actors, right? So I think we think about all of these things. This is kind of, this is the bread and butter of political settlement processes and of political settlements themselves, right? We haven't talked as much about what are we actually talking about in practice, this is the middle, the middle space between settlement and between some of the case study work that unfortunately I had to miss out on yesterday, but I know was fantastic from the papers. So in terms of moving from war to peace, it's really difficult to examine this kind of fleeting, temporary, and contested institutional space. Part of these processes, what makes them so difficult for us to wrap our heads around and to compare and contrast and operationalize is that they are constantly being contested and reconstituted. Um, I'm going to try and skip through some of this. I want to focus in particular on women in armed groups because they highlight some of the gender continuities that we've already talked about this morning, um, but then they also come into, into practical consideration when we look at how political settlements happen and who gets power and who doesn't. So participation in armed groups is very difficult to define. Um, there's a, a continuum between civilian and combatant, of course. There's all sorts of different roles that people take up in order to maintain armed groups. Um, but it's, there, you can also have discontinuous participation. People move in and out of their roles. People move in and out of areas that are occupied by armed groups, and armed groups, of course, are moving in and out of space during wartime. Um, in terms of kind of broad generalizations, women overwhelmingly perform essential support and logistical functions, and men dominate leadership and decision-making roles. This is particularly true in state militaries. It's also true in rebel groups and insurgencies. And this, of course, mirrors what we see in peacetime, right? In a lot of ways, war is not radically different than, than peacetime roles and power dynamics. Um, in terms of participation rates, women's participation is unknown. Um, on a binary, about 45% of non-state armed groups are understood to have female participants. 60% of rebel groups have female participants. And in a study of African rebel groups in particular, 87% of those in large-scale civil wars had female participants. So there are some kind of broad trends that we can identify in terms of the kind of gender dynamics and gender inclusion of war. And then I'll talk about the gender inclusion of peace. Um, Rebel groups are more prone to having female participants than state militaries because they rely on population-based support and they have broad recruitment in order to survive. So it increases the opportunity for women 
to engage in the conflict. Um, they also go to local communities rather than bringing people just to the military bases. Um, there are four correlates of women's participation, force recruitment, terrorist tactics, gender inclusive ideology, and large numbers. And what's interesting about these is some of them don't seem to jive, right? So groups that use terrorism often include women because they have a tactical advantage that women aren't expected to be purveyors of violence, and so they can therefore access public spaces and they can spy and provide intelligence in ways that aren't expected because of patriarchal and um, masculine norms. And forced recruitment wouldn't seem to fit with a gender inclusive ideology that might include women as a sort of form of empowerment. Forced recruitment may be including women for very different reasons. So I'm not going to get into this now, but if you want to talk about it in the questions, I'd be really happy to engage with why armed actors include women in their organizations. In terms of what women do in wartime, um, there's a heavy concentration of women in a military domestic sphere, particularly in rebel groups. These women help, they're essential to the functioning and sustaining of the armed group. They provide food, they provide labor, they often provide um, sex and relationships that keep men willing to fight in the bush for years on end. I've talked about the tactical advantages, and then there's also kind of political reasons to include women in armed groups for propaganda, for PR, to help mobilize men, to mobilize other women, and of course for women's empowerment. At the organizational level, we see a few patterns um, that are really important for thinking about the post-war settlement. So first of all, it's really common to see dual command chains for women in armed groups, and particularly in rebel groups. This means that they're often gender segregated command structures. There might be a women's auxiliary corps. You might have a women's wing. Um, this means that women are often encountering power and promotion in these militarized settings as women. The second trend that is really important for understanding the organizational politics is gender relations are really tightly controlled. So the relationship between men and women is often essential to how leaders of rebel groups create organizational cohesion and how they maintain control of fighters, both male and female. So this often extends to the private sphere. If you're in a militarized setting, and particularly if you're in the rebel group itself, if you're considered a group member, um, your personal life, your family life, who you're allowed to have sex with, who you're allowed to rape, all of these things are controlled by the organization. And again, they're controlled through both formal and informal institutional policies. In terms of the distribution of power in armed groups, some women become powerful. They might be rising through the ranks of the women's wing, of a women's auxiliary corps. They may be rising through the ranks of a women's wing, but still having command over men. In my work on female power brokers, I've identified five sort of key characteristics that make women more likely to have power and status. But these are all um, neither necessary nor sufficient, right? So the first and most obvious one is if women have pre-war social status, they can become valuable to the group and they can gain power and social status within the group. And of course, there's a corollary that sometimes groups are so focused on overthrowing existing power structures that women who have power before the war are actually targets. So it's not, it's not one or the other. Um, education and skills can also make women valuable to the group and they can use their education and skills as a way to navigate up the ranks in a fairly meritocratic fashion. Military training is, is a key way that women who I've worked with have been able to access power. It's really just by proving themselves to be equal to men, to be violent actors, to be capable of speaking in the parlance of war and rebellion. Um, age and structural factors, we've talked about intersectionality, this continues to be important in really contextually, culturally specific ways, depending on where the groups are set up. Set up. So some have ethnic or religious dynamics, a particularly pious woman might be able to succeed in a religious organization. Similarly, older women in my work in Sierra Leone were able to be protected within the group because they had social status. And the last one that's really, really hard to talk about, but absolutely essential to understanding women's roles and their positions as power brokers is their relationship to men. And this is where that gender dynamic between men and women really comes to the fore. It's very hard as feminist researchers to say, actually, female power brokers usually have ties to powerful men, but commanders' wives are absolutely often the most powerful women, the most well-protected women, the most kind of materially and socially secure women in rebellion. So I want to park that for a second and talk about women in peace agreements. 
gender is um, sort of the it's gender inclusion is sort of the last bastion for the women, peace, and security agenda. Female representatives are overwhelmingly excluded in armed group delegations. <coughs> so while I've done lots of work on women in armed conflict, um, all of the women that I've talked to were left at the sort of outside of the, the peace talks entirely. They're actually left at the airport. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's like I the plane in the first place. Yeah, that was the helicopter. Five minutes, okay, it's fine. So in terms of exclusion, women tend to be excluded from power sharing deals, they're excluded in TDR programs, um, and they're of course overwhelmingly excluded in the delegations for peace negotiations. Um, the reason I wanted to start with where women stand within armed groups is because I think if you, if you presume that armed groups are mostly men, if you presume that violence and political power within armed groups is, is purely wielded by men, then it makes sense that we would have male representatives of armed groups and peace talks. But of course that's not the case, right? So the vast majority of rebel groups have female participants. Participation rates vary from 20% to 45%. Um, and yet the status quo continues to see women as civilians and not power brokers or spoilers who are essential to having at the peace talks. When women are included, they're often included as women, and particularly as women in civil society spaces. So the one way in which women can get access, guaranteed access, to armed group representation at peace talks is through delegation quotas. But primarily we see women as interest groups, consultations, parallel processes, and then of course mass actions that are trying to influence um, negotiations and peace processes from out with the <coughs> formal process. That's a sort of track one, track two distinction. And then there are some trade-offs in whether or not women are included. So if women are at the table formally, and if women are able to represent sort of the armed group or women within the armed group, then their interests can be subsumed by patriarchal political dynamics. So having women representatives of rebel groups may mean that women representing the rebel group represent the, the rebel group. They don't necessarily represent female interests. They don't necessarily have a fundamentally different paradigm than their male counterparts. We don't have enough evidence to know whether or not this is true because there aren't enough women included in armed group delegations. Women at the door, on the other hand, can mobilize more contentious political voices and actions, but they may be more marginal to the core processes, right? So they can push for women's issues, they can push for the women's struggle, but they're doing it from a position of, of power that's derived outside the process itself. And so I see, like, we can talk a bit, a bit more about this, Christine touched on it yesterday, but there are trade-offs in, in how women are included and where they're included. Um, I'm just gonna touch on two of these case case studies, because we're running short of time, but Sierra Leone is where I've done the bulk of my field work, and I've worked a lot for many years with women in the RUF, and there were two factions of women within the RUF, both of whom were really high up in the organization. One were the militant women, and they were left at the helipad, but the wives of commanders were also left at the helipad, and they didn't agree with one another at all. They'd had a long-running fractious relationship between commanders' wives who hadn't been trained, who weren't seen as being sort of violent actors or political actors in that case, and the militant women who'd been a part of the organization since its like very founding, and who had long had infighting with these sort of overprivileged, as they saw it, civilian women within the group. Um, and the reason that this case is particularly interesting to me is one, because it shows that even when women are invited to come, they can get left behind. Um, and we've seen that happen over and over again in a number of cases. But also, once women are included within armed group delegations, we can't assume that they're going to be able, even at the subgroup level, to agree with one another. So we talk about whether or not women are going to represent women's interests sort of across groups. Um, but even within a group, you may have women who have such intense gender dynamics between them that it challenges their ability to bridge the gap once they get to the table. And the other case study, um, I don't know if we covered it yesterday, it was the Yemen National Dialogue, which has been happening, happened in 2013 and 14. Um, this is a really interesting one because there was a 30% quota in formal delegation representation for women, and there was a 40 seat separate women's delegation. So this is really, I mean, this is my idea of the sort of best practice inclusion of women, that you have women both in the formal delegations where they can represent 
their group's interests. They don't have to represent women's interests. And you have them in a specifically gendered space where they can focus on women's interests, but from their interse intersectional positionalities. And what happened here is really, really contextually specific, but women's rights became a lightning rod in the discussion. So because of the Islamist nature of the conflict and the political discourse, women's rights became this hot button issue and it generated a backlash against the participant security. So it was actually the external political space where civil society became essential to protecting women's participation and to generating women's participation because their formal participation actually created gender dynamics that, that were probably more problematic than if women had been there in, in seemingly less threatening numbers. Um, so it raises kind of important questions for thinking about what best practice is and what compromises might need to be made in terms of achieving what we want or sort of women-friendly and feminist outcomes and peace processes, um, even if it doesn't look like the kind of gold standard of inclusion at the table. I don't think I have much time for this, but just because I know Christine's going to talk about it at the lunch break, I did a little digging in the gender and um, peace agreements database. This is this is from like March or something. We haven't had a chance to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it's changed this. <laughs> uh, but it's really yeah. interesting. So when I was looking at it, there were 261 peace agreements included. And I wanted to look at what impact had happened from 1325. Um, and this is, this is not about women participating, but rather about the normative framework that underlies these, these agreements. And, and rather than trying to, to weave this all together, because I'm sure I'm time, I'm just going to throw it at you. But after 1325, um, there, were, there was a massive increase in the mentions of gender in women. But it happened in really particular ways. So there were 1.8 times more mentions of equality, which sounds good, until you realize that there were 3.5 times more mentions of sexual violence. And so I think after 1325 and the sort of the groundswell of advocacy that we've seen, it's actually shifted the way that women are being included in the text itself. So you have an increase in kind of mentions of women, but an even more prominent increase in mentions of women's victimhood and the sort of protection, um, the protection regime, if you will, that um, Fanula was talking about earlier this morning. So I wanted to put that out there as something we can kind of touch on for thinking about what inclusion means at the table, but also what it means in the text and, and what are the sort of normative um, institutional implications for what we're the environment that we're doing peace agreements and political settlements in, and then who are the actors who are achieving it. There are regional <coughs> variations that I think are really important. We've talked about the national level. You have the sort of regional dynamics, particularly in African peace processes. Um, just going to put that there, but what are the regional dynamics in, in text borrowing, in norm diffusion? Are they substantive or are they superficial? And then to just really quickly end on a couple of questions for us. In terms of the implications for political settlement research, I'm sorry I haven't had more time to explain all of my kind of connections that I've made, but um, there's a real need to better understand and specify what spaces we're seeing settlements in and what spaces there's maybe less settlement and more unsettlement. And I think, you know, war and peace actually raise some really important questions for political settlement in particular. And because it comes from a political economic background, kind of in terms of the academic intellectual life of political settlements research, um, there's a tendency to see and analyze settlements after they exist. But I want to know if there are ways that we can start to identify how they're being concretized and how they're how they're actually formulating and crystallizing as they're in the process of being negotiated, debated, or actually fought for. What is the relationship between formal and informal power in organizations and in institutions? So which actors can and must sustain settlement processes, and which ones can disrupt it? And maybe actually part of the challenge that women have faced is that they haven't been essential to the disruption or the sustenance of political settlements, right? And so if you're not essential from a social and political perspective as a group, then how can you make yourself necessary, right? How can you access political space that you haven't actually been able to claim? The third question is, how can we disaggregate units and levels of analysis for meaningful comparative insights? This is probably the one that I think is most important, but it doesn't sound particularly interesting. Uh, but we need to know which units and levels of analysis we're talking about. 
And then for policy, um, I'm just going to focus on, on the last one, which is that norms really aren't enough. What we've seen in the case studies is that enabling environments, organizational structures, the, the organizations that send delegations, for example, or that participate in constitutional processes, um, they're really essential to, um, to kind of disaggregating and figuring out where actors as individuals and as groups come into these processes. And informal institutions um, often determine implementation. Implementation isn't my specialty, but it's usually how the implementation of a peace process is brokered, is, is through informal power structures. It's not through sort of delegations. And so that creates a lot of opening for women. A lot of women's representation actually happens in the sort of commissions that oversee whether or not peace agreements are being implemented. But it would be helpful if we had more research on the continuities between the people who are represented at the process and the people who are included um, in the implementation stage. Thank you very much.